monkeying is what was happening. you are now. Let me remind you of uh, one announcement before we get started, which is this. Spring baptism is going to be on Sunday, May the 26th. If you are interested in being baptized, you would need to type out your testimony and get that to me. You would also need to desire church membership, which means that you would need to go to gracebible.online and read the church covenant and ask yourself if you are uh, seriously willing to keep that covenant if you want to be baptized. And if you are interested in being baptized on the 26th, Get your testimony to me this month. Do not wait till the week of. Uh, sooner is better, okay? Also, somebody, somebody leaves me some macadamia nuts up here once a month. And I don't know who you are, but I just want to thank you for the macadamia nuts because a, a, a lot of times on Sunday morning, I don't even get a, a chance to eat breakfast. I came in here this morning. There's the nice macadamia nuts. So whoever you are, God bless you. You're a wonderful person. Nick, will you come and read a call to worship, please? Good morning. Good morning. I'll be reading Psalm 116, verses 1 through 7. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. 
Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my, lo oh, return, o my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountiful, bountifully to you, with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear God, uh, please use this time to glorify yourself. Uh, please help Ren as he brings the word to us. Please, please help us have open ears, open hearts to receive it. And just use the songs, the message, the, the praying, all to glorify you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Brent, you're going to do by faith first. Okay, let's stand and sing. Did you tell the guys back there? Yep. Okay.
Luke 7, uh, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it, those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that you give us to be in your house this morning. We thank you for the freedom we have to come to this building. We thank you for the freedom we have to worship in this country. We're thankful that we've been able to, to hear about this narrow road, Lord, to hear the gospel. Father, I pray that you would help us to not take these, the opportunity and the freedom we have to worship for granted, Lord. Um, I pray for those this morning that are here, that are on the, the wide road, Lord, the path that leads to destruction. I pray that you would work in their hearts and in their minds. I pray that you would convict them of their sin. I pray that they would see their need for a Savior and that, that they would understand, Lord, that the path they're on does lead to destruction and to death. And, I pray this morning this service will glorify you. We thank you for the band and the music. Thank you for Brent, Lord. I pray that you would bless him. I pray that everything that we say, everything that we do this morning would be honoring to you. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
pray. Father, we thank you for your great grace and your great mercy that is indeed greater than all of our sin. And we're thankful that the blood of Jesus has taken away the guilt of our sin. We're thankful that you sent him uh, to bear the wrath of God in our place and that you gave us faith to believe. Pray, Father, that as we look at this text from 1 Timothy chapter 6, you would continue to increase our faith even more. Uh, Lord, you know that we are weak, that we are needy, that we are failing. Uh, remember our frame. Remember that we're dust. Uh, we are creatures and you are the creator. And we are utterly and totally dependent upon you for all things. Uh, without you, we could not get another breath. Our heart would not beat another beat. And without Jesus and his blood and his righteousness, we could never come before you to worship you in a way that would be pleasing to you. I ask, Father, that you'd help me to preach uh, under the blood of Christ and in the merit of Christ. I ask, Lord, that you'd help us to hear in a way that is transformative and productive. Uh, Father, help us to receive these verses for what they are, the Word of God. Uh, Lord, where we need to repent, help us to repent. Uh, Father, if there's one thing that we have in spades at Grace Bible Church, it is sinners. And so help us, God, to, to repent of our sins this morning. Help me to repent of mine. Uh, we would confess that we hear a whole lot more truth than we put into practice. And I pray, Father, that you would give us unction and power and the help of the Holy Spirit to make good on what we hear this morning. We pray that you would forgive us of all of our sins, uh, not because our sins are not serious, not because they are not grievous, not because they are petty or small, but because Christ died for us. I ask, Father, that you would give me grace to preach, <clears throat> help me to speak as one speaking the very words of God, help me to say the things that you would have me to say, help me to get my mind off myself and on to Jesus Christ, help me to be a conduit of blessing and grace and mercy to the people that you sent this morning. Uh, please continue to grow your church here, bring sheep, keep away wolves, Make us more like Jesus this morning. Uh, thank you that we can call out to you and that you hear us. Please be merciful to us now as we look at your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully you've made your way to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to read verse 6 through verse 12. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Uh, we covered those verses about three weeks ago now, and here are the verses we're going to focus on this morning, verse 11 and 12. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Okay, so Easter happened and we had a Palm Sunday message and then we had an Easter message. So it's been three full weeks since we've been in the book of First Timothy. But we're going to pick that up again this morning. Uh, if you'll remember, when we left off three weeks ago, Paul was warning us about the danger that accompanies the sin of greed, covetousness, and materialism. If you'll recall, we were dealing with the danger that comes from a desire to be rich, the danger that comes from the love of money, the danger that comes from failing to be content with Christ and seeking that contentment and satisfaction and joy and life in money and stuff, in money and what money can buy. Now, in verse 10, Paul warned us that if we allow the sin of discontent, the sin of covetousness to grow in our hearts unchecked, that it will damn our souls forever. Look at verse 10. 
For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So if we pin our hopes on money and what money can buy, if we fall for the lie that money will meet my needs, money will make me happy, then we will wander away from the faith. You see, there is a real heaven to gain, and there is a real hell to turn away from. So it is imperative that we not be among those who eventually wander away from the faith. And that's what Paul is concerned with as he sets out here in this paragraph that is comprised of verses 11 through 16. He's trying to show Timothy how to persevere in the faith. And that is the question we want to ask this morning. How do we persevere in the faith? Three answers from verses 11 and 12. The first answer to our question, how do we persevere in the faith, is this. Run away from sin and run toward virtue. Run away from sin and run toward virtue. Do you see that in verse 11? <clears throat> but as for you, O man of God, flee. Flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. So the man of God is a running man. He runs away from sin and he runs toward virtue. Uh, this is a combination that occurs frequently in the New Testament using different verbiage and different words. Uh, think about Luke 9.23 where Jesus said this, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, let him flee sin and selfishness and take up his cross daily and follow or pursue me. Or think about Ephesians 4, verse 22 through 24. Paul says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, flee the things associated with the old man and pursue the things associated with the new man in Christ. In order to persevere in the faith, we as Christian people must take action. We must run away from sin and toward virtue. Paul tells Timothy in verse 11, flee these things. What things is Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about the things he has just discussed in the previous verses. Flee the desire to be rich. Flee from the love of money. As a man of God, Timothy must flee from the materialism that dominates the hearts and minds of false converts and unbelievers. Basically there in verse 11, Paul's saying, run like your pants are on fire from this materialistic mindset that unbelievers and phony Christians are dominated by, Timothy. You know, my oldest daughter had some interaction with two friends this week who claimed to be Christians. And my oldest daughter was very upset by the fact that these two friends were boasting about their Lululemon pants. Okay? I, I just realized this week that it's not Lululemon. It's, it's Lululemon, whatever that is. And so she had two friends that were boasting about their Lululemon pants that cost $150 a pair. And one of those friends was also boasting about the fact that she had a Louis Vuitton handbag. Uh, these two friends are both teenagers who claim to be Christians, living in homes with parents who claim to be Christians, and yet they are boasting in, delighting in, enamored with the same worldly materialistic status symbols that unbelievers everywhere go gaga over. In verse 11, Paul tells Timothy, flee from this kind of worldly, shallow, carnal, materialistic thinking. Timothy, get away from that stuff and get away from it fast. Paul does not tell Timothy, uh, son, slowly take one step away from materialism. He says, run, run as fast as you can. Get away from this stuff. And so there's a basic principle here that we have to understand as Christian people. If you want to be a Christian, five 10, 20, 30 years from now, if you want to be a Christian when you draw your last breath, you and I cannot dilly-dally with sin. If you do not flee from sin, it will slowly but surely gain strength and power and influence over your heart and your mind, and eventually that sin will cause you to wander away from the faith and pierce yourself with many pangs. It will master you.
And when that happens, you will not continue to believe in Christ. You will not continue to follow Christ. So let me ask a question. What sin are you playing footsie with today? Flee from it before it gains any more power in your life than it already has. It will not be easier to flee from it next year or five years from now. The easiest time and the best time to flee from sin is today. You see, the Bible tells us to flee a lot of different sins. Idolatry, uh, flee idolatry, flee sexual immorality, flee youthful passions, flee from materialism. We must flee from sin or it will get the best of us and we will not endure in the faith. Friends, do you realize with this topic of materialism that Paul is telling Timothy to flee from. We live in the most materialistic culture in the history of the world. Now, people have always loved money and people have always loved possessions. That's nothing new. But never before has the temptation to acquire more stuff been as strong as it is in our current culture. In our digital age, an adult living in a metropolitan area in a single day will see somewhere between 50 and 400 different advertisements. As I drove to church this morning, I drove through the Barker's Creek straightaway where Uncle Bill's flea market is. Just in, in that straightaway, you can count upwards of 60 different advertisements in one straightaway trying to get you to buy this and acquire that. We are bombarded by this stuff all the time uh, through the Internet pop-up ads, magazines, commercials, flyers in your inbox and mailbox, uh, email marketing campaigns, etc., etc., all of which are meant to generate discontent in your heart and fuel materialistic desires to buy more and acquire more and have more and find satisfaction not in Jesus Christ but in the next bigger or better thing. Church, if we're going to flee from the love of money and the love of stuff, then we have to keep these constant temptations to materialism and worldliness from coming before our eyes all the time. Some of them you can't avoid. I can't drive from my house to here without passing a billboard. But many of them we can avoid and we should avoid. Matthew 6, 22 through 24. Jesus is talking about materialism. <clears throat> He's talking about money and covetousness. And he says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, and in this context, bad means covetous, greedy, materialistic. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So one of the best ways to flee materialism is by keeping your eyes off the things that stoke materialistic, discontented desires in your heart. A pastor named David Mathis says this. He says, we must watch what we watch. What we feed our eyes will eventually rule our hearts. Whether it be sports scores, news headlines, Instagram or Facebook, Amazon or Target, YouTube or Netflix. Just because something is not inherently bad does not mean it can't fill our eyes so full as to crowd out the one who matters most. Godliness will require vigilance in what we watch, especially in a society aggressively marketing everything else. We have to watch what we watch in order to flee from materialism and greed and covetousness. We have to guard our minds against this continual flood and inundation of advertising that's meant to make you discontent and tempt you to find life and happiness in the next thing that money can buy. Parents, if you have children who are getting into their teen years, do not let them hang out with materialistic kids that are their age. Don't let them hang out with friends who are all about the, the, the most expensive clothes and the next gadget and all about stuff, stuff, stuff and what money can buy. Don't let them make friends with those people and spend time around them because that stuff is infectious, that materialistic more, more, more attitude. Don't let your children get chummy with worldly, materialistic people. And don't spend much time with carnal people like that yourself if you're an adult believer. Flee these things by fleeing this type of person. Don't chum around with people in the rat race, even if they claim to be Christians. Find some other people to hang around. The word flee there in the Greek is the word fugo. Fugo. We get our English word fugitive from this word. 
Paul's saying you and I should be fugitives from the constant bombardment of materialistic advertising and materialistic people. And we should be fugitives from credit card balances that are up to the moon because we just had to have this and that and the other and we had to have it now. And we should be fugitives from competing with the Joneses. Oh, I've got to have a new vehicle because so-and-so at church went and got one. You should be a fugitive from that kind of mess. And you should be a fugitive from the love of money and from the love of possessions. Flee it. But it's not enough to simply flee from materialism or to flee from any other sin. We have to replace the pursuit of money and stuff and sin in general with the pursuit of virtue. Do you see that in verse 11? Pursue. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. So the goal of the Christian life is much more than I'm going to not sin today. We must also seek to grow in Christ-like character. Every virtue that Paul tells the man of God to pursue is a virtue that was found and expressed perfectly in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. He was perfectly righteous, perfectly godly. He had a perfect faith, a perfect steadfastness, and Jesus was perfectly gentle. And that perfection is our righteousness before the Father this morning, church. But as Christian people, we have to pursue the virtue that is ours in Christ Jesus. Pursue these things. Don't just get up and say, I'm going to try not to sin today. Turn away from sin and pursue Christ-like virtue. If you don't, you will not be a Christian much longer. You'll play out. It may be 20 years from now, but you will play out if you do not flee sin and pursue virtue. We have to seek to grow, brothers and sisters, in fair and honest dealings with others if we're going to pursue righteousness. We have to pursue greater devotion to Christ himself if we're going to pursue godliness. We have to take greater risks and get out of our comfort zone if we're going to pursue faith. We have to grow in sacrificial service to others in order to pursue love. We have to grow in our ability to be patient in difficult circumstances and be patient with difficult people if we're going to grow in gentleness. Question, how much effort are you putting forth pursuing Christ-likeness? How much effort are you putting forth in pursuing Christ-likeness? How does our pursuit of Christ-like character compare with, say, our pursuit of screen time of some sort? Is there any passion or commitment or affection or exertion? Do we have a plan? You know, anyone pursuing something has a plan. They're not just wandering around hoping that that something will drop into their lap out of the clear blue sky. If you're pursuing something, you have a plan to acquire that something. What is your plan for growing in Christ-like character? It will not just happen. Verse 11, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Which of these virtues do you believe that God would want you to focus on personally? This coming week, what is one behavior that you could flee from and replace with a Christ-like behavior that would enable you to make progress in just one of these virtues? We have to take action if we want to persevere in the faith and continue to be Christians when we're breathing our last breath. So how do we persevere in the faith? One, run away from sin and run toward virtue. Number two, number two, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. See this in verse 12. Verse 12 says, fight the good fight of the faith. So brothers and sisters, before you became a Christian, you were on the broad and easy way with the rest of the world. You were going with the flow. You could make progress downstream without even paddling because the current was always going with you and the wind was always at your back before you came to Christ. But the moment that a person is truly converted, the moment that a person truly trusts in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and truly receives Jesus as Lord, the moment a person truly receives the Bible, all of it, as the Word of God and truly commits to the path of costly discipleship, from that moment on, the true Christian enters into a battle a daily fight against the world, against the flesh, and against the devil. Therefore, any Christian who aims to persevere in the faith has to realize that he or she is at war. As a Christian, you must fight or your faith will die. You must fight against your own sin. You must fight against your own self-centeredness. 
You must fight against your own self-righteousness. You must fight against the constant temptations that the world is throwing at you day in and day out. You must fight against the attacks of Satan and the people that Satan will stir up to provoke you and attack you. And you must fight for the souls of your children and your family and your friends and fellow church members. If you do not fight, you will die and your faith will die. The word fight in verse 12 in the Greek is the verb agonizomai. Not too hard to uh, see what English word we get out of that. Agonize. The word fight is agonizomai. We get agonized from it. In other words, the true Christian life is a struggle. It is a battle. It is a wrestling match. A fight. If you want to persevere in the faith, you have to realize that the Christian life will often be an agonizing fight to persevere in the faith and to persevere in faithfulness. In the parable of the sower, Jesus talked about a seed that fell on rocky ground, and here's what he says about it in Matthew 13, 20 and 21. He said, As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, the word being the gospel of Christ, and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. In other words, the person who comes to Christ with a wrong understanding of the Christian life, not realizing that it is a fight, not realizing that it will cost you dearly, not realizing that the Christian life will leave you battered and it will leave you bruised, not realizing that the Christian life will entail suffering and sacrifice and pain and stress and fear and hardship, that kind of person will not endure in the faith. That kind of person will not go on in the name of Christ. Why? Because they fail to realize that the Christian life is a fight, a battle, a struggle, a wrestling match. Fight the good fight of the faith, Timothy. John MacArthur says this. He says it to pastors, but there's a principle that is applicable to all people. He says this. Burnout does not come from hard work. It comes from unrealistic expectations. Likewise, failing to persevere in the faith does not come from the difficulty of the Christian life. It comes from unrealistic expectations about the Christian life. To become a Christian is to enter into a war, a battle, a fight. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, Paul said this. He said, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. So if we don't wage the good warfare or fight the good fight of faith, if we don't realize that we're in a spiritual battle, then you and I too will make shipwreck of the faith. We will fail to persevere. Church, there is nothing easy about the Christian life. It's not easy to pray. It is easy to watch TV. It's not easy to live in community with other Christians. It's easy to sit at home on the couch every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night. It's not easy to talk with others about Christ. It is easy to simply keep your mouth closed and go on about your business. It's not easy to be patient and forgiving toward people who are continually doing the same foolish things over and over again. But it is very easy to give up on them, isn't it? It is not easy to live sacrificially. It is very easy to spend all your time and all your money and all your energy catering to your own self, pleasing your own self. It's not easy to stand for the truth in a world that hates the truth. But it is easy to just go with the flow and keep your head down, is it not? It is not easy to be slandered for doing what is right and speaking things that are true. But it is easy to remain anonymous, isn't it? To persevere in the faith and to persevere in faithfulness is a fight, a struggle, a battle. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. The gate is wide and the way is easy easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. It's hard because it is a fight, a fight. So anyone seeking to live for the Lord Jesus will be attacked by the enemy. 
Um, the, the person that I know who gets attacked more than anybody else is my wife. She gets it usually once a day and sometimes up to 12 or 15 times a day from different people. My wife gets attacked all the time. She gets shot out from all directions. Uh, it is seemingly endless and seemingly relentless. And even people that want to take a cheap shot at me and don't have the cojones to do it will come and try to get to me through my wife. So uh, she, she takes shots all the time. Uh, and she will uh, often say to me this. She says, uh, what am I doing wrong? There's so many people in every direction who have it out for me, who don't like me, who are taking a shot at me. Am I doing something wrong? And the answer is, uh, yes, in the devil's eyes, you're doing a whole lot that's wrong. She is seeking to be a faithful pastor's wife and faithful as the director of a Christian homeschool group and faithful as the director of the children's ministry at this church and faithful as the mother and teacher of three young girls. Therefore, she is in the enemy's crosshairs all the time. He would love to pick her off. And if he can't get somebody to take a cheap shot at her, uh, she'll just stub her toe on the edge of the bed like last night and break it. it <laughs> it's one thing right after the other all the time. And if she would just quit trying to fight the good fight of faith and lay down and quit, the enemy would stop shooting at her. Typically, uh, the thought of fighting has negative connotations in our mind. When we, when we think of a fight, we think fights are bad things. But Paul says that this fight is not a bad thing. He says just the opposite in verse 12. Look. He says, fight the good, the good fight of the faith. So the fight to persevere in the faith and persevere in faithfulness and to contend for the truth of the faith once for all delivered to the saints, that's not a bad fight. That is a good fight. John Stott says this. He says, nobody enjoys a fight unless, of course, the person concerned is pugnacious by temperament. Fighting is an unpleasant business, undignified, bloody, painful, and dangerous. So is controversy, that is, fighting for truth and goodness. It should be distasteful to all sensitive spirits. There is something sick about those who relish it. Nevertheless, it is a good fight, and it must be fought. Church, brothers, sisters, do you feel like it's hard to be a Christian? Do you feel like it's a real struggle to do what's right and to stand for the truth? Do you feel like you're always walking uphill? Do you feel like the wind is always in your face? Do you feel like you are continually trying to row upstream in the Christian life against the current every single day? Do you feel like someone who has been in a long, drawn-out wrestling match? If that describes you this morning, then don't be discouraged because the Christian life is not a walk in the park with the Veggie Tale characters and the Care Bears. It's a fight. Not only is it a fight, but verse 11 reminds us that it is a good fight. So don't give up. Even if you're weary and discouraged and downtrodden, do not give up. Keep walking with Christ. Keep fleeing from sin and keep pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Keep speaking truth and keep standing up for the truth of God's word. Why? Because there is an amazing reward for those who persevere in faith until the end and for those who fight the good fight to the end. Listen to 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Paul says near the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. In other words, the difficulty of the fight is nothing compared to the awesomeness of the reward. Jesus, if you persevere in the faith, brother, if you persevere in the faith, sister, will himself put a crown of righteousness on your head. He himself will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a little. Now enter into the joy of your master. So how do we persevere in the faith? Number one, run away from sin and run toward virtue. Number two, fight the good fight. Number three, quickly, seize eternal life. Seize eternal life. See this in verse 12? Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. 
Uh, the verb there, take hold, liter literally means seize it. Seize eternal life to which you were called. Now, it may seem strange to tell a pastor like Timothy, who's obviously been a Christian for a long time, that he needs to take hold of eternal life. Did he not already have eternal life as a free gift by faith in Christ? Well, of course he did. But Paul nonetheless urges Timothy to take hold of the eternal life that is already his in Christ. He says, Timothy, seize it, enjoy it, live it to the full. Don't be half-hearted or lackadaisical in your pursuit of the eternal life that is already yours by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul, 100% Calvinist, 0% hyper-Calvinist. In Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Paul talks about seizing eternal life using slightly different language. He says this, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. He strains forward. He presses on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was already a Christian. He already had eternal life, and he was straining forward and pressing on to lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ had laid hold of him. And that's what he's exhorting Timothy to do in verse 12 when he says, Timothy, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. This reminds us that nobody gets to heaven passively. Did you hear what I just said? Nobody will passively make it to heaven. We must actively take hold of the eternal life that is already ours in Jesus Christ. Listen to Luke 16, 16. This is an interesting verse. I'm not going to expound it. I'm just going to lay it out there, and you can, you can dig in it a little more when you go home this evening. Jesus said, The law and the prophets were until John, that being John the Baptist. In other words, uh, John the Baptist was the last of the Old Covenant prophets. The law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. Since then, the good news of the kingdom is preached. Since, since then, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came on the scene. The kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. Forces his way into it. So if we want to enter the kingdom of God, we must force our way into it. We must wage the good warfare we must fight the good fight of the faith. We must seize and take hold of eternal life. Nobody casually becomes more like Jesus. Nobody casually makes it to heaven. This is why Jesus would teach salvation by grace alone on one hand, and then in the next breath he would say things like this in Matthew 5, 29 through 30. He said, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is what it means to force your way into the kingdom of God. This is what it means to take hold of or to seize eternal life to which we have been called. So in verse 12, Paul urges Timothy to seize eternal life which highlights the fact that a Christian cannot be a nonchalant, dispassionate, apathetic sluggard. That's not what faithful Christianity is about. It's not about coasting. Okay, So many who claim to be Christians in America give off this vibe that the Christian life is a leisurely vacation punctuated by occasional appearances at church whenever it's not too much trouble to show up or there's nothing more exciting to do at that particular time. That's not the Christian life. People like that will not be in heaven. But a Christian is a man of priorities and conviction and intentionality. Why? Because he knows that eternal life is not something that falls into his lap while he is looking at Facebook or checking out sports scores. Eternal life is something that must be actively taken hold of or it will not be had at all. As Paul comes to the end of this epistle where he's been exhorting Timothy to be faithful and to stay in the race, he does not say, Timothy, once saved, always saved, so why don't you just go to the bar and drink a half a dozen beers and let your hair down? That's not what he says. He does say, Timothy, since Jesus has freely given you eternal life, take hold of it. Verse 12. Look with me again. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. 
and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What in the world is that talking about? That's talking about Timothy's conversion and his subsequent baptism, which would have been in the presence of many witnesses. Timothy had publicly acknowledged Jesus as Lord and publicly professed faith in Christ through baptism. And making a public profession of faith like this is a serious matter. And Paul is reminding Timothy of this. Church, brothers, sisters, if we don't persevere in the faith that we profess, it brings reproach on the name of Jesus Christ. It brings reproach on the church. It brings reproach on the Christian faith, on our own selves, in the eyes of many witnesses. We have baptized people at this church who have stood here in front of 75 or 80 people down at the baptism hall, professed faith in Christ. Six months later, where are they at? Who knows? They didn't count the cost. And I don't want to be anybody like that on the last day. We live in an age when most people who make a public profession of faith in Christ do not finish well. Will you, be among, will you be among the multitudes who name the name of Christ, get baptized in the presence of many witnesses, and then casually drift farther and farther away from Christ? Will that be you? Will that be me? I know lots of people who have publicly professed Christ, been publicly baptized, and now they live a life that is indistinguishable from that of the average unbeliever. They don't love Christ, they don't love his word, they don't love his church, their God is their belly and their end is destruction. The blackest, listen to me, the blackest depths of hell are reserved for these kind of people who have a little taste of the heavenly gift and say, I love Jesus and I trust Jesus and I'm going to be baptized and then they just drift off, drift away from Jesus and follow sin. Listen to this, 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of life than to start down that path and make a profession and then turn back. I think of, uh, I think of Judas. Remember what Jesus said about Judas? He said it would have been better for that man to have never been born than to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and then to abandon the faith. Or think about Hebrews 10, 29 to 30. Remember, we're, we're thinking about this in light of people who make a profession and then wander away from the faith. Hebrews 10, 29 to 30. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, we often quote that verse. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That verse is stated in the context of people who say, I'm a Christian, baptize me. And then off down the road they go and you never see him again. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God's got something special cooked up for people like that. And I do not want to be among them. And I do not want you to be among them. Let me encourage you to stay the course, church, because there's nothing worse than confessing Christ in the presence of many witnesses and then bringing reproach to his name by wandering away from the faith. So let's resolve to finish well, church, by running away from sin and running toward virtue, by fighting the good fight of the faith, and by taking hold of or seizing eternal life to which Jesus has called us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have enabled us to believe and we pray that you would sustain our faith, but that we, Father, would be active in fleeing from sin and pursuing righteousness, that we would be active in fighting the good fight of the faith 
and that we would be active in seizing the eternal life that is ours in Christ Jesus. Our Father, we pray that you would preserve us to the end. We ask, Lord, for those who are so weary this morning. I know there are many people in our fellowship who are weary because the Christian life is hard and oftentimes it feels very long and drawn out and we wonder when some of these circumstances in our life and some of these battles we're fighting are ever going to end. They go on for decade after decade after decade. Lord, would you give us a supernatural strength this morning to keep pressing on toward Jesus, to keep straining toward the goal, uh, to keep believing in Christ and not to grow weary because you promised that at a proper time we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up and that harvest is eternal life. Father, remind us of how short and how brief this life is. Remind us of how long eternity is. And Lord, on the last day, uh, I pray that we would not hear the words Uh, From your mouth, depart from me. I never knew you. I pray, Father, that we would not be among the many false converts in our day and age. I pray that we would not be those who make a profession of faith and then walk away from the faith. Lord, have mercy on us. Uh, Please keep us believing. Uh, Please grow us in love for Jesus, in love for the church, in love for one another, in love for the Word of God, and in a deep and abiding hatred for sin, especially our own sin. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ivy's going to play. You go to the Lord in prayer. Prepare your heart to take communion. table is for baptized believers in Jesus Christ. If you are not a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, refrain from partaking until you have repented and believed and been baptized. The Lord's table is also for saved sinners. All Christians are saved sinners, but if you're harboring some kind of unrepentant sin in your heart, we ask that you would make that right with the Lord Jesus before you come down here and partake. When you're ready, you may come.
Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing by faith.
who promised is faithful. You're at liberty to go.